Okay, I'm not calling in from the future. I'm actually calling in from Portland, Oregon. Um, and uh, my uh, my wife says that as a futurist, that I live my life 10 to 15 years in the future, and I commute home on the weekend. So I guess I'm I'm commuting home to the present to uh, to talk to you today. But it really is a, a a pleasure to be here. And what I wanted to do today was talk to you a little bit about what I do as a futurist, why Intel has a futurist. Um, I'm a technological futurist. And then tell you actually about this journey that I have been going on for the last couple of years around uh, this project that I call Humanity in the Machine. I'm going to explain a little bit of that, and I think at the end, it'll start to make, I think, a lot of sense to the work that you do and the very important work that you do with your peers and your colleagues in the community that you work in. So I'm going to share my uh, my screen and share my presentation. And let's make sure. Can everybody see that? Okay, wave if you can see that. Okay, good. Everybody's waving. That's great. By the way, it's really cool. I can see everybody, which is pretty awesome. Okay, so what I wanted to talk to you about today was designing, designing the future that you want to live in. And it's I want to talk to you about this um, project that I did called Humanity in the Machine. Um, it is a first in a series of, of books that I've released um, thinking about this, this notion of the intersection between humanity and technology, which is really kind of what I do as a, as a futurist. And I, the first thing I looked at was greed. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll kind of go into that. So um, my first slide if you look at it and read it very closely, says that I work for a large company and we have a lot of lawyers. <laughs> so everybody's seen it, everybody's great. Okay, now we can move on. Okay, good. So who am I? Um, as I said, my name is Brian David Johnson. I am a futurist um, at the Intel Corporation. I was actually Intel's first futurist. Um, I also do work with the U.S. government. I do work with the military. I do work with trade organizations and nonprofits. Um, I also work with, with small businesses as well, doing this sort of work of, of looking at the future. Um, really, it's my job to look 10 to 15 years out into the future and model what it will feel like to be a human being and live in the future. I'm a very, very pragmatic futurist. My, my day job at Intel, I write a spec. And the spec says, you know, this is what people will want to do 10 years from now. And the reason why I do that is because at Intel, it takes about five to 10 years for the corporation to design, develop, and deploy the chip. So it's a vital business importance today for Intel to know what people will want to do 10 years from now. And I've been able to take this, and I've, I've taken, as I said, to different governments and militaries and nonprofits with that same sort of thinking that we all – need to be active participants in our future. And, and taking this future casting work is a way to get people to think out into the future. Because, the, And I'll tell you a little bit more about the work that I do of how we then apply that back to Intel. But it's this notion that as we look out into the future, we can then say, this is the future that we want, and this is the future that we want to avoid. And then we can start taking very specific steps to get to that future. That's sort of how I'm judged at the corporation. I'm a, I'm a principal engineer, and so it's really my job to not only come up with a vision for the future, but then also to sit down with my colleagues and work with them to show the very specific steps that they can take today to get to that future that they want. But really, if you really want to know who I am, you can tell everything you need to know about me by looking at this picture. So in this picture, there's the tall, bald one, that's me, and then there's the very small, good-looking one. That's Arthur. I labeled them so that you could tell us apart. Now, Arthur was one of the first robots ever created at the University of Essex Robotics Lab. That's one of the work, one of the things I do a lot of work, and I do a lot of work with artificial intelligence and a lot of work with robots. And he was one of the first robots ever created at the University of Essex Robotics Lab. So as I say, you can pretty much tell everything you need to know about me by looking at this picture, evidenced by the fact that I went all the way to the United Kingdom and had my picture taken with a 20-year-old robot. You can rest assured, I am a geek. 
I am a huge geek. I am a complete nerd. I love everything science, everything engineering. I love science fiction. And the work that I do kind of brings these two things together. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you a bit about today. Now, as we start to do this work of envisioning the future, we need to have a vision for that future. We need to have a vision in our minds to say, this is the future that we want to build towards. And the picture on this slide is, is pretty much when people talk to us about the future, we're normally shown pictures like this, right? You have a, a very good-looking guy or a very good-looking gal, and you, you, usually have, you usually have a really kind of awesome, kind of streamlined piece of new technology. And then they're usually in this sort of super hip, kind of urban-ish-looking apartment that everything's sort of clean. Now, I have to tell you, I hate this picture. I hate this picture because when I look at it, and if this is supposed to be a vision for the future that we get shown through advertising and media and movies, if this is supposed to be a vision of the future, I ask myself, where are the baby toys? <laughs> I look at this and I ask myself, where are the pillows? Where are the, where are the family photos? You know, where are the, the things that we surround ourselves with that make ourselves comfortable? That's the, the wonderful thing about human beings is that we are incredibly complicated. We have diverse opinions and diverse backgrounds. We have different religious beliefs. We have different cultural beliefs. And this is a good thing. This is a really, really good thing. Now, I can say that I hate this picture because this picture comes from Intel, my company which doesn't make me a lot of friends in the marketing department, just so you know. <laughs> now, the reason why I hate this picture is because if we're really going about doing the honest and hard work of building the future, when I look at this, at best, I find it intellectually dishonest. And at worst, I find it insulting. I find it insulting to the complexity and absolute awesomeness of diversity of human beings. So... On my next slide, I have a picture of what the future is actually going to look like. Who would like to see it? Oh, you're all so polite. You're all so polite. I saw you raise your hand. <clears throat> now, I have to tell you, so as, a, as being a futurist, I spend a lot of my time on the road. I actually spend most of my time outside of Intel. And I spend a lot of time in front of schools. I, I talk to schools quite a lot. And I was standing in front of a crowd of about 600 undergraduate engineers. This is one of the hardest audiences you can ever give a talk to. And I'm there, I'm, in, I'm Intel's futurist, I'm talking about the future, and I show this slide and I say, who wants to see the future? And it's completely silent. Except for one kid, except for one kid way in the back who goes, sure. So I come all the way to Intel, you know, I come all the way from Intel, I'm Intel's futurist, I'm talking about the future, I'm going to show them the future, and all I get is, sure. <laughs> so, okay, get ready. Hold on to something, because this is where your life changes. Literally, you are going to see the future. Your life from now on will be judged by this day. You have now, you will now, after this point, have seen the future. So get ready. Maybe hold on to the person next to you. You may not know each other, but get ready, because here's where it changes. Here it is. Bam! <laughs> now, I have to tell you, so this, this comes from some social science research that, that we've done in my lab. Now, I have to show you that pound for pound, there is more future in this photo than there is in the previous photo. This is a woman in the United Kingdom. She has a connected laptop, a connected smartphone, she has a connected television. She even has a connected picture frame. So there is more future technology in this picture than in the previous picture. But the reason why I like this is because it's real, right? She's surrounded by stuff. She's surrounded by the stuff that makes her comfortable, right? There's things on the chest of drawers. The drawer is open. She's in her bare feet. This is human, right? This is, this is a realistic world, right? And when I look at this, this is the type of future that I envision. This is the type of future that I want to design for. I want to design a future that is populated by actual human beings. And this is also a type of future that I want to live in. 
because I can tell you I don't want to live in a future that looks like this because this looks like prison. <laughs> this actually looks like a comfortable future. I don't, you may not be able to see it, but down in the corner she actually has a pillow that says chill out. So this is, so in my orientation, this is the type of futurist that I am, and this is the goal that I set myself, is to have a deep understanding of the human beings, the global human beings all over the world, and the cultures and the diversity of human beings, and understanding that this is the type of future that I want to design for. So how I do this, and I, and I won't get into this too much, and we can, if you want to get into it in the Q&A, we can talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts about what I do. But if you remember nothing else about my talk today, please remember that I do not make predictions. I don't make predictions. For me, predictions are absolutely useless. Typically, if somebody is giving you a prediction, they are trying to sell you something. For me, and, and what I tell my students and what I tell the people in my lab is that I don't want to be known as the person who was right. I think you see this all the time. You see it with pundits. People stand up and say, I said this thing about the future and I was right. And you, you sort of get that all the time. This is absolutely useless to me. I tell my students and I tell the people in my lab, we want to be the people who get it right. We want to be the people who can come up with an actionable vision for the future that we can begin to make devices and technologies. We can begin to design businesses. We can begin to design things that we can put into people's lives that make their lives better. And that is the goal. That is the bar that we should hold ourselves to is how are we using all of this technology? How are we using all these amazing things? And I'm going to talk to you about some of them. How do we use them to make people's lives better? And that's really what my, my process is, the future casting process is. It's a way to develop an actionable vision for the future based upon an understanding of people, and then to share with my colleagues and share with the people that I work with some very pragmatic steps that we can use to get there. So what will the future look like? There's there's this, this, this fact on this slide is something that really changed my outlook to the future about, about five or six years ago. And what this says is that as we approach the year 2020, the size of meaningful computational power, the size of the chip that goes into all of our devices, as we approach the year 2020, the size of that begins to approach zero. We're at 14 nanometers in size today, as we approach the year 2020, we get to the five nanometers in size. Now, five nanometers is about 12 atoms across. It's insane. It's amazing. And it, but what that means is that we can turn anything into a computer. We could turn this table into a computer. We could turn my jacket into a computer. We could even turn my body into a computer. But it fundamentally changes the question we have to ask ourselves, because for decades in the high-tech industry that I come from, we asked ourselves a very different question. We asked ourselves, can we do it? Can we make a desktop small enough to fit into somebody's lap? Can we make a laptop small enough to fit into somebody's pocket or their pocketbook with a smartphone or a tablet? It was, can we do it? But when you have the size of meaningful computational power approaching zero, you don't have to ask, can we do it? Because we can turn anything into a computer. The question we have to ask ourselves is what? What do we want to do? And why? Why do we want to do it? And this began to fan out for me, that it became not so much about technology, but about what we can actually do in the world, what we can do with our organizations and our businesses, what we can do as communities, to not actually ask ourselves, can we do it, but what do we want to do and why? And this began to drive a project for me, which I'll talk to you about in just a moment. Now, I want to take just a quick second to, to, to look at, I love this, this image, by the way. Hopefully everybody can see in the year 1960, the woman's got a bouffant hairdo. And hopefully everybody can see in, in 1970, the guy's got bell-bottom pants on. Can anybody, and I can actually hear you as well, can anybody guess who that is in the year 2010? Who is that supposed to be? Steve Jobs. I heard somebody say Steve Jobs, thus proving that you are smarter than I am. Because I've had this graphic for a while, and I had it for about a month before I realized that was Steve Jobs. I was literally on stage and from a thousand futurists 
when somebody screamed out, that's Steve Jobs. And I went, oh, my goodness, that is Steve Jobs. And so I called the graphics team. So I called them and I said, do you know that that's Steve Jobs on my, on my, on my slide? And they just laughed. They're like, I know. It took you like a month to figure it out. <laughs> and then they did the thing that they love to do. They went, futurist, click, and hung up. So this really kind of drove me, this, this notion of what do we want to do and why do we want to do it. And this one of the things that I started seeing is this, this notion around data. And we've all heard about big data. People will talk to you about big data all the time. Maybe people will talk about big data today, and you can keep them honest. And so what I do is I model what it'll feel like to be a human and live 10 to 15 years in the future. And so when you ask people about big data, ask them about it. They will tell me more about this big data. And what they will tell you is that it is big. <laughs> and then you should push them a little bit more. You, you will say, well, tell me more about this big data. Like, what will it do? And how will we use it? And how will it affect people? And they will tell you that there is a lot of data. <laughs> and that's why I always, that's my bar, right? My bar is how will we use this big data to make people's lives better? How will we use it? What will it feel like? And I began to see that as we looked sort of 10 years out, that data would start taking on a life of its own, that you would have algorithms talking to algorithms, you would have machines talking to machines, and they would be doing this out in the cloud. And this is actually a very good thing, that data would actually have a secret life of its own. And this is great because we can use all of this big data to actually make people's lives better. We can make them healthier. We can make them more efficient. We can make people more sustainable. We can entertain them more. That, that was that bar, and, and, I, and I was going around and talking to people, and literally I was working with cultural anthropologists to say, how can we design algorithms so that they understand the human beings that they're going to come and touch? This is one of the big things that I championed in my company, and also when I go out and talk to people that say, all this big data is absolutely meaningless until it comes down and touches the lives of people. That all those ones and zeros, they're, they're, they mean nothing until it comes back and touches people, because it's always about people. If you're made, regardless, regardless of what you're doing, and I know as an audience you know this, if you're making computers, it's about people. If you're doing a service, it's about people. If, it's about, if you're working in education, it's still about people. And it's always about people and people interacting with each other. So even when we're having this crazy secret life of data, it's still about people. So that was my question, is how will all of this data come and affect people's lives? And so I had been going around talking about this for a while, and then this happened. So I was in New York City, and it was May 6, 2010. Um, and I don't know how many of you know what this actually represents. This is the flash crash. It was called the flash crash of 2010. Um, and what happened is that in the space of a, a matter of seconds, um, the stock market crashed. And what it's called the flash crash is um, the next day when I was walking down the street, I actually saw the headline on the newspaper, and it said, machines crash the stock market. And it freaked me out. And it didn't freak me out because of the normal reasons. It freaked me out because it was an example of this secret life of data. What, it was an example of what was called high-frequency trading, is what some people have attributed it to, is this notion that, and, and high-frequency trading, it's, it's actually not very complicated. It, it's this notion that you're using software and trade. And what had happened is that the machines, in the span of only a couple of hours, had literally tanked the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And it, as you can see, it recovered very quickly. But the thing that really freaked people out wasn't that the machines had done it, was that they didn't know why. Literally for um, weeks afterwards, even you would go on and you could go watch CBS or read the Wall Street Journal, and they didn't know why it happened. And so I take my job very seriously, and this notion that we would have the secret life of data, and again, if you haven't noticed yet and you haven't picked it up yet, I'm an optimist, by the way, that I think that the future is built every day by the actions of people. And so if the future is built every day by the actions of people, then why wouldn't we have an amazing future? Let's go build an awesome future. Let's not build a future that sucks. Let's build a good future. 
And so I'm an optimist. And so for me, when I saw the secret life of data, I said, wow, we can do amazing stuff with it, right? We can use it to make people's lives better and make them more efficient. But here was an example of data going off and doing harm to people. And so I made a decision to actually go and investigate this and find out what it actually meant, but not only what actually happened. There's a lot of people who had done that, but what its implications were on our future. And that's where this project came up, this, this project called Humanity in the Machine, which was a, a, a book that has now turned into a series about this intersection. It wasn't just about the flash crash. It wasn't just about algorithms and machines and data, but it was about where that intersected with humans, where that intersected with businesses and communities and in our society. And so I went off and I started doing an investigation on this. And so I went to the financial industry, financial analyst industry, and started asking people and learned about high-frequency trading. And again, high-frequency trading, it, it, it's not that complicated. It's simply algorithms that are sort of making trading decisions on their own. Um, and they're doing it very quickly. They're doing it actually at the speed of light, which is one of the things that I find very interesting. Sort of any business that works at the speed of light, any business that uses the speed of light as a, as a, a point of competition would be interesting to me. I'm a physics nerd, so I was, this was really fascinating to me that they were using physics and the speed of light and fiber optics as a, as a way to compete with each other. But I went and started talking to the high-frequency high frequency traders about what led to the flash crash and, and actually how much of it had to do with it. And, and what I learned was that it really wasn't the machines that crashed the Internet. Because if you start to look at an algorithm, an algorithm is really just a, uh, it's just a recipe. Really, what an algorithm is, it's a series of instructions that you give to a computer to execute it. You do this, you do this, you do this. It's actually very much like baking a cake. Right? You take the wet ingredients, you combine them with the dry ingredients, you mix them together, you literally put them into a pan, you put them into an oven, ding, it comes out, boom, you can make a cake. That's very much what an algorithm is. It says do this, do this, do this, do this. And we as humans make those decisions. We actually write the algorithm. And so as I was talking to them and talking to the financial analysts and talking to the, um, the economists, it turned into – a single question, and it was this question, what are you optimizing for? So I went and talked to the, um, the high-frequency traders and asked them and said, well, what are you optimizing for? And they said, well, we're optimizing for profit, right? That's sort of what they do in financial services. And I said, oh, that's very interesting. But the thing about profit is profit all by itself is not bad. There's nothing wrong with profit. Promise, profit is just an, right, it's an economic metric for understanding the return from resources and, and, and labor. The problem is people. That when you put people into the mix, we're wonderful, we're flawed, we have, we have lots, of, uh, lots of opinions. But when you bring people into the mix with profit, you get greed. Um, now, greed is not a very good thing, right? Now, greed, aside from harming people, is also one of the seven deadly sins. I think it's number three on the hit list that will get you sent to hell. <laughs> greed is bad. And so I was, and I went and talked to, um, in the, this is in the book, I looked at, um, talked to some historians, and they began to say, you can look at the entire history of the American stock market as a history of crashes and panics. That literally you can look at all markets as a history of greed because that's what it is. If you have a human being, and you're going to have bad behavior. And so you, that's really – it's the human element that's been brought into this that makes people – that sort of brings about the greed. And so I started saying, well, can we optimize for something other than greed? Can we optimize for something other than profit? And number one, I went back to the economist, and I said, well, can we optimize for something other than profit? And Paul Thomas, who happens to be the chief economist at the Intel Corporation, who's a very good friend of mine, he basically said to me, he said, Brian, nothing gives economists greater consternation than optimizing for anything but profit. <laughs> and so I said, okay, I understand that, Paul, but can we do it? So I went back to the high-frequency traders, and I said, can we optimize for something other than profit? And they said, of course we can. They said, 
what do you want to optimize for? I mean, we're optimizing, you know, we tell the algorithm to go do these things, and it goes and does, that's what it does. So, I mean, a great example of this is in this, this type of world, there's something called liquidity. And liquidity is how much information you have about a stock. So basically, a stock that trades a lot is a stock that trades a lot. A stock that doesn't trade a lot doesn't trade a lot. Literally, if you set liquidity, a level of liquidity, so a level of information about how many times a stock is sold, if a stock isn't sold, literally that stock doesn't exist to that algorithm. Literally, it's just blind to it. It's sort of like, to go back to my, my cake example, if you have an algorithm that you use to make chocolate cake, in the world of that algorithm, there are no strawberry cakes. Literally, strawberries do not even exist. So I went back to them and said, well, could we optimize for something other than profit? And they said, sure. We just have to tell it to go look at these different things. They said, we could optimize for something like quality. You could actually go and look at the quality of the stock. You could also optimize for sustainability. There are actually metrics out there, um, Bloomberg Finance. There's actually sustainability indices that people aggregate recycling, they aggregate conflict minerals, that you can actually go and create a metric so that you can actually look at different parts of the business and actually optimize for very, very different things. And this is where everything changed for me. And this is why I wanted to come and talk to you today and why I think that this, this question, what are you optimizing for, became something to me that was incredibly powerful because it became less about technology and all about human beings and the decisions we make. And so I started going around and asking people, what are you optimizing for in your business? What are you optimizing for in what you're doing? And I got some really interesting, um, interesting responses. I went and talked to a group that is doing peer-to-peer -peer lending, social lending. This is, people, this is people who will lend money to people who banks can't lend money to. Literally, the banks can't do it. The way that their business models are set up, they can't loan those money. It could be because of the credit of the person, or it could be just the amount of money, really, that that person actually needs might be too low. And so I went and talked to a couple of firms who did that, and I said, well, what are you optimizing for? As a part of your business, what are you optimizing for? And they, they told me right away. They said, oh, Brian, that's easy. We're optimizing for the American dream. We are doing our business so that we can get money into the hands of people so that they can achieve the American dream. And then I started going around and asking more people. I started saying, I went to, um, there's a, a young woman by the name of Crystal Beasley, who's a serial entrepreneur. She makes these companies. Um, and she has seen in this world of entrepreneurship and venture capital, she has seen her friends almost commit suicide. Because in the world of venture capital, the way that a lot of money is given is that they make bets. They make a certain number of bets. And then they push the companies, push the companies really, really hard to sort of hit those metrics because they're trying to get the next Facebook or they're trying to get the next Twitter or Instagram. And they're pushing them all to do that. And this, she had seen, you know, some of the, again, some of the greatest minds of her generation almost reduced to suicide because of the pressure that's been put on them. And she thinks this is absolutely ridiculous. So she was saying that VCs should not optimize for that. They should actually optimize for the people that they're investing in not for the companies themselves, but for the people. Because entrepreneurs and serial entrepreneurs are always going to be doing it. An entrepreneur can't be stopped. They will always be an entrepreneur. When I, I teach, actually, in an MBA program, and I have my students who are entrepreneurs, and I tell them, okay, so you're all here to learn about being a futurist and, and you want to be an entrepreneur. I said, here's my first bit of advice. Become a dentist. And they all kind of look at me, right? Here's Intel's future is telling them to become a dentist. I said, look, become a dentist. You're going to be more successful. You'll make more money, probably. Your parents will probably be really proud. I mean, who wouldn't love to have a dentist in the family? Come on. And I look at them, so I say, go, leave, be a dentist. And they all sit there kind of shell-shocked. And nobody leaves. And I said, good. Because if you're an entrepreneur, you don't have a choice. It's in your blood. Even if you become a dentist, you would still be an entrepreneur. And that was sort of the beauty for me of what Crystal Beasley had said, is that you, if you optimize for the human beings, that you could actually make lots of money. She's a raging capitalist. You could make lots of money, but you could do it by caring for people, not by driving them to some arbitrary metrics in the hope of some payoff down the line. 
And there's lots of examples of, of this notion around what, what could we optimize for. Um, and I'll give you a, a tech example. There's uh, some work that I do, I said I work with the American military. The Army is actually doing work with smartphones, where they're using smartphones as a way to treat post-traumatic stress syndrome, PTSD, right? PTSD is an awful, awful disease that strikes our soldiers when they come back from the battlefield. And the really awful thing about this disease is it's always there. And the problem is that family members and physicians who care for these soldiers, who want to take care of them, they can't be with them all the time. But then these researchers that I was working with realized that with almost all of these soldiers, this could be with them all the time. So they started optimizing the smartphone to keep an eye on the soldier. So they could use the accelerometer to see if they're walking around. They could see if they're being social with people. They could understand their habits. And so that if they weren't being social, if they were being sedentary, if they were maybe even going to some websites that were showing some depression, that the smartphone would then actually reach out to a family member and say, hey, you know what? It might be a good idea if you, you know, reach out to your loved one. They may not be doing well. Or if it started to ex escalate, they could reach out to the healthcare individual. So that what they were optimizing for was not only the care of the soldier, they were literally optimizing these smartphones to be an extension of their love. They were, it was an extension of wanting to care for the soldier, an extension of wanting to make them healthy. So this, this word, so what are you optimizing for, became this sort of mantra, and, a very, and it clarified really, really well what we were doing. And I realized that when it came to our um, businesses and when it came to the things that we do, when it came to our organization, that this really became an extension of ourselves. That when it comes to technology, when it comes to our businesses, that they are an extension of us. We literally imbue our technology, we imbue our businesses with our sense of humanity. We imbue it with our sense of the future, with our cultural values, with our hopes and our dreams. We literally put that into the technology. It becomes an extension of ourselves. And I started thinking about the ramifications of that, both the good and bad ramifications of that. And I started realizing if you accept that, if you accept that human beings, we imbue our businesses and our organizations and our technology with our humanity, that we have a responsibility. And I looked at the nature of evil, literally looking at, looking at evil. And if you go back and, and you look at different studies that have been done around war crimes trials and terrible atrocities, you find that the nature of evil, that evil isn't this demonic thing that's out there trying to do bad things to good people, that the nature of evil is thoughtlessness, not thinking about what you're doing not thinking about the results of what you're doing, the effect of what you're doing. So that if we accept the fact that we optimize our technology and our organizations with our sense of humanity, what that means is if we aren't present about that and we aren't asking ourselves what we're optimizing for, we actually become implicit. We create machines and organizations that do evil. But on the so other side of that, if we do ask ourselves what we're optimizing for and we have that conversation, what that means is that we can actually design our technologies, our businesses, our organizations to actually be our better angels. Much like those algorithms that could be designed to look at very specific things, they don't have ego. They don't have the human bad behavior in them. So we could actually design our organizations and our technologies to be a better version of ourselves. And I would hazard a guess that a lot of you in the audience today, that that's what you have done and what you strive to do. Don't get me wrong, I love humanity and I love the complexity and the good behavior and the bad behavior of human beings. It's sort of what it makes us great. But if we ask ourselves what are we optimizing for, that we can literally make our organization and our technologies to be our better angels. They can not only allow us to be more human, they can allow us to be better humans. And so that this question just became so, so powerful to me. And so as a futurist, I take my job really seriously. 
I realize, especially having the platform of, of being Intel's first futurist, it means that if I do my job correctly, that I can actually touch the lives of every human being on the planet. And that's actually one of the stated goals of Intel, why I'm actually quite proud to work at the company, that in all of the conference rooms, it literally says within the next decade, it is our goal to touch the lives of every human being on the planet. And what I tell people in my lab is I've added and make their lives better. Because as I mentioned before, I believe that the future is built by people. The future isn't an accident. It just doesn't happen. The future is built every day by the actions of people. So you can't punt, right? You have to create that future. And so I started asking myself, well, how do we do it then? Because if the future is built every day by the actions of people, what do we do? How do we actually change that future? How do we look out and say, this is the future that I want, and this is the future that I want to avoid how do I get to that future that I want? And so I traveled around the world and talking to a lot of the different people that I work with. And I ended up in London talking to a political activist by the name of Cory Doctorow. He's also a, a science fiction author. And he and I, we basically like to argue a lot. We sort of get together and sort of argue about things about the future. And I asked him this question. And we came up with an answer that is incredibly simple, but I think incredibly powerful. That the way you change the future is you change the story that people tell themselves about the future that they will live in. Right? This is an amazing thing. Because if you can change the future that people tell themselves about, if you can change the story that people tell themselves about the future that they will live in, they will make different decisions. They will do different things. I've seen this happen. I've seen it happen in my own company. I've seen it happen in organizations. I've seen it happen in the military and in the government. Because if you can change that story, people will literally do something different. And the way that you change that story is by having conversations. Is that you go to people and you ask, what are you optimizing for? What is the future that you want? What is the future that you want to avoid? Because if you can change that story and it's done person by person, just like the future is built by people every day, the way that you change the story and the way that you change the future is going and talking to people, sitting down and saying, this is what I believe. What do you believe? And continuing that conversation. And it's in so much of the work that you do, and it's in so much of the work that we do and, and that I do in nonprofits, is to go out and have that conversation and to have a vision for that future, to say, this is what I want. This is what I stand for. And this is what I don't want. And this is what I stand against. And this is something that I think is really important. It's something that I do a lot with corporations, where I sit and I work with them in these future casting sessions that they start to define the future that they want, to have that vision, and to say, what do you stand for? Literally write it down. I, I would encourage you during the break or when you have a chance right now, literally write down that as a human being and in your organizations, what do you stand for? And then flip it. And ask yourself, what do you stand against? Because intellectually, there has to be a, another side of that. If you stand for something, you have to stand against something else. It's inverse. I'll give you an example. I was doing this with uh, a, a global staffing company. And, and what they stood for was, you know, a fair wage. What they stood for was, um, you know, the right work at the right time. And then when I asked them, well, what do you stand against? It sort of illuminated the world for them. It meant that what they stood against was child labor. What they stood against was forced labor and, and prostitution. And what it also means is if you can also then not only focus on what you stand for, but if you can also focus on what you stand against and actively try to, to alleviate that, what that means is if, if you can make that go away, it becomes a multiplier for what you stand for. And it's been a, a powerful tool for me as I go around and talking to people about how do you change that story. And it's those stories. It's those values. And, again, I think as you go out and talk to people, you are going to meet and talk to people that, who don't agree with you. And I always remind people that you have to remember that the future involves everybody. The future involves people you don't agree with. The future also involves people you don't even like. But 
it involves everybody. And part of how you get there, power, part of how you get to that future is by having those conversations and by telling those stories. And this is my challenge to you today. I would argue that because you are here, because you're going to spend these two days together, working together, hearing this great line of speakers and sort of challenging yourself, that's really my, my challenge to you, is to always ask yourself, what is that future you want? What is that future you want to avoid? What do you stand for and what do you stand against? And in everything that you are doing in your organization, what are you optimizing for? And then turn to the person next to you. Go up to somebody at a break and start talking about that. Say, this is the future that I want and this is the future that I want to avoid. And you can start talking about what you need to do to get there. But you, as leaders, you have to have that vision and you have to be able to communicate that vision. And what I go and I tell everybody that I talk to when I go all around the world, and I don't have to tell you, but I do want to remind you, is that the one thing we need to do, I think the bar that we need to hold for ourselves, the notion of what we're optimizing for, is to make people's lives better. To use all of our passion, to use, for me, all of the technology, all of the work that we do, to understand that ultimately it's about human beings. And that ultimately all the work that we're doing is about making people's lives better. So that's my challenge to you for the next couple of days, is to have that vision and then talk to people. So I have one more slide, and so get ready with your questions. Again, you can ask me anything, so get ready. <clears throat> but my, my last slide takes a little bit of a story. So as I was coming up in, um, in industry, I wrote speeches. This was many, many years ago. This was before I was at Intel. So I was a speechwriter, and every single speech that I wrote for one of my executives, he made me include a picture of dogs playing poker. <laughs> I was very young. I didn't question it. I said, yes, sir. And so in every presentation that I did for him, I included a picture of dogs playing poker. And I got really good at it. So if there was a, a TV screen in the background, I'd put a picture of dogs playing poker. If there was a picture frame, I'd put a picture of dogs playing poker. Hopefully you, hopefully you all know this picture. It's got a little bulldog, and he's kind of got a card in his foot. I know this picture really, really well. So this went on for many years. And then we were parting ways. I was actually leaving the company, and he was going to a different country. And I finally got up the gut to ask him. So I said, sir, why did we have to include a picture of dogs playing poker in every presentation that we did? And he kind of smiled at me and said, Brian, everybody loves pictures of dogs playing poker. Why wouldn't you include pictures of dogs playing poker in every single presentation that we do? And he was right. I've taken on this tradition. But in every presentation that I show, I don't include a picture of dogs playing poker. What I do include are pictures of animals using technology. The longer you look at this, the longer you look at this, the more freaked out you are going to get. <laughs> and so with that, I will say thank you very much. It was a pleasure. I'm going to stop, uh, stop sharing. All right, Brian, thank you very much. That was um, fascinating work and fascinating perspectives for us to take forward, including the cat playing with the uh, electronics there. Uh, so we're going to turn over to the fun segment of hearing from you guys. What questions do you have for Brian? And we have folks <coughs> walking around with mics on both okay, ends good. of the room. So as, as, as you guys get a chance to start look here, I'm going to show you just how nerdy I am. This painting back here, as I mentioned that I, was, I am a commissioned painter, this is actually a painting that I did. Here's how nerdy I am. If you can see here on the painting, it's a painting of satellites. There's satellites over here and satellites over here. This is actually binary code. It's actually real binary code, the ones and zeros of binary code. And actually, I did it because I had the satellites talking to each other. And if you type that binary code into a binary code translator, it literally translates to, I am here. I am here. Because that's what satellites say to each other, thus proving I am such a nerd. All right, so questions. Who's first? 
And Brian, you can hear us, correct? Mm -hmm. Great. Hi, I'm David Kippen. I run a nonprofit lending library called Libro Shmibros. Thanks a lot. Great presentation. I got one question. To what extent is today the future you were telling people to prepare for 10 or 15 years ago? That's an excellent question. Um, I'm pretty much 98% accurate. And the reason why I can say I'm 98% accurate is I work at an engineering company. So literally, like, Intel has to make bets today for what they're going to do 10 years from now. Literally, they have to spend billions of dollars to build fab. So if I get it wrong, I don't have a job anymore. And as a part of that, um, I've been, I, I write everything down. So if you're really interested in it, <clears throat> there's a book I wrote called Screen Future, which looked out to the, the, the future of 2015. And... In it, we actually keep some pretty good metrics, and it's been pretty good. It, what I had said back in 2005, it was this. What I told people was that um, that the reason why it's called Screen Future was to say that it was all going to be about screens. Um, that you know, at that time, if you remember, right, it was you. If you wanted to make a phone call, you went to your phone. If you wanted to get on the internet, you went to your PC. If you wanted to watch TV, you went to your TV. And what I said to people is that. You know, we're going to be watching TV on these things. And that we're going to be on our computers using it to be social. And we're going to use it to, to uh, watch television. And when I was at Intel, they hated that. They were like, we're a serious company, and you're telling us that everybody is going to use all of these screens to watch TV and to be entertained. And I said, yeah, pretty much. That's what everyone's going to be using all these screens for. And they hated it. They wanted to kick me out of the room. And, and I always have to attribute our CTO at the time who said, wow, you made a lot of people really, really uncomfortable there. You should go do that. You should go work on that. And that was, that, that was the thing. That's the other part, though, about being a futurist and sort of being kind of a nuts and bolts futurist. As a lot of times when, like especially with this book, Screen Future, when I go to the bookstore now, that book is in the technology history section. So it's a book that I wrote about the future that hasn't completely happened yet, but is now a work of history. It's, it's a bit of a, yeah, it's a bit much. But, yeah, I'm always very, very transparent about the stuff that I do. So it's actually been, been going quite well. The other thing is that my wife finds it very annoying to go to dinner parties with me and stuff like that because I sort of talk about stuff, and I, um, I get calls then from my friends, and they'll call me, and I've been talking about this screen thing, and a friend of mine called me from Times Square once. And if you remember Times Square, if any of you have been recently, there's screens everywhere, right? There's people on screens, there's people doing screens, there's screens everywhere. And he started screaming, and it, it kind of came like something from the movie Network, where he was just like, oh, my God, it's about screens, and I can't take it anymore. So, going pretty well. Uh, Michael Alexander with Grand Performances. You got our brochure. You got to come to our concerts. They're all free. For you. Will technology ever replace the obvious, to me, human need for humans to gather in groups with other humans? No, it won't. I mean, that's the thing about humans, is humans love other humans. I mean, we're social animals. That's who we are. I mean, literally, it's why we have been so successful. It's why, evolutionarily, we beat the saber-toothed tiger, right? We were these funny-looking, hairy little things kind of running around, and the saber-toothed tiger had fangs and had things and had claws, but we were able to beat the saber-toothed tiger from an evolutionary standpoint because we're social, literally. Literally, the, the, there's evolutionary biologists, and I love evolutionary biologists because they look at biology, right, and they say, well, what has been successful? And, you know, evolution is a, is a, is a harsh barometer. And what they said was they were looking at consciousness, and they were saying that why do human beings have consciousness, our type of consciousness? And they looked at it from this evolutionary biology type standpoint. And it was a paper that came out in the journal Nature last year. And what they said was the reason why we had our consciousness was our ability to tell stories to each other, our ability to communicate back and forth. For me to say, hey, I just ate these berries last week. Don't eat these berries. Very bad things will happen. And then for you to say to me, oh, if you want to get fish during this time of the year, go there. That our ability to be um, to communicate with each other is so tightly tied into who we are. Now, what I think is happening with technology is human beings love people. We love being around people, but we also just love connecting with people. 
So the moment you can get a piece of technology and that technology allows you to connect with somebody, we're going to use it for that. You know, literally, you know, the moment somebody got a laptop, they used it to tell a joke, right? The moment, literally, that's what people use. There's a whole history of the telegraph. And that what people used to do with the telegraph is the telegraph operators used to literally sit there and tell jokes to each other in their off time. Like, they would literally just, like, goof off. And it was like, you know, it was the Internet before the Internet. It was basically the equivalent of looking at funny cat pictures on the Internet when you're supposed to be working. That's what they were doing. So I think we'll always use technology, and technology will always afford us new ways to be social with each other. I think we're seeing that. Literally, you are seeing that right now, that we can use technology. But the fact of the matter is, is human beings love other human beings, and we really love being in the same room with other human beings. So, no, I don't think that'll go away. Hello, Brian. My name is Oscar Menjivar. I'm the uh, founder of Urban Teens Exploring Technology, where we teach uh, young Latino and black boys how to become technology, and we inspire them to become technology entrepreneurs. And one of the questions I have for you, it's in terms of speaking about future and, and future jobs and being a futuristic like yourself, I'm wondering, we talk about code a lot, teach them how to code, which we do teach them how to code, we teach them how to design, and, and, and we help them think about problems that will self that they will solve for their communities um, using technology. But I'm wondering, what other skills do you have in mind that you've seen that has taken you from being a technologist to also being a futuristic thinker to be able to kind of help companies like Intel to s help people in the world with new technologies? What are those skills that you are seeing that are needed right now and in the future for us to continue doing that? That's a great question, and, and I'm glad you brought it up. So. <clears throat> Number one, and, I, and if any of you have seen me talk or heard me or seen anything, I always tell people that one thing when they say, how do we prepare for the future, I say learn to code. Everybody should learn to code. Everybody should. Not that I think everybody's going to be a computer programmer in the future, but it, code and algorithms are the language that we use to communicate with machines and what machines you use to communicate back with us. And I, I, I don't make predictions of the futurists, but the thing I can tell you is that we will have a lot more computers in the future. And having that skill, just like a language skill, is incredibly important because of the way that it forms people's brains and the way that it allows us to talk. And also, I'm glad that you're doing work with young Latino um, um, boys and African-American boys. It's incredibly important um, for them simply to be active. Um, one of the things that I, I've been a, a big proponent of and been pushing very hard on is this notion of we need diversity. Um, and we've known this from um, a biological standpoint. We've known this from a system standpoint, that the more diverse the inputs you have to a process, the better the output. We know this. And actually, I'm beginning to see corporate America begin to change, not only when it comes to diversity, um, but a diversity not only of ethnicity, a diversity of gender, but also a diversity of age. I think is incredibly important. Um, and that would be one of the things that I would tell them is it's not that uh, so often when I, when I work with, with young boys and also young girls, what I tell them is that the future needs them, that they're the ones who are actually going to build the future, that companies like Intel need them, and that they need to understand that, and they need to understand, do their studies, and approach those companies in that way, not to be prideful, right, not to be haughty about it, but to understand that to be on the right side of the future is to be diverse. And from a business standpoint, there's now even um, economic metrics that are beginning to show that the diversity of women, the diversity of ethnicity in uh, job markets, and especially in the high-tech market, is needed for its growth, and certainly as, as its global growth. So I think that's one of the things, is actually to embrace the fact that those companies need them and that those young minds will actually build the future. I think the, the, the other area that I would encourage them for is that actual the human part. So to be a very good engineer, you also have to be a good human being. That, and one of the things that I've been really happy to see about is that the plethora and the different types of engineers that are out there. That I actually went and talked to um, a gentleman at the University of Minnesota who was the dean of the engineering school, and he said his most successful engineers were young women who were also studying dance because it was that diversity of mindset, but that because they also had a humanities background, they could express themselves. 
And I think this is one of the things that I think is incredibly important, is that you not only have to have a vision for the future, whether you're a futurist or somebody who's doing code, but you also have to have the ability to communicate it with other people. That embracing the fact that we are very, very social animals, but at the same time, that to get anything to done, and especially in this connected world that we are in right now, that you have to be able to communicate with other people. And those communication skills are really, really important. Hi, Brian. Uh, Dennis Young, Children's Dental Center at Greater Los Angeles. You were talking dentistry. Um, quick question for you. I was lucky enough to meet uh, Ray Bradbury and also got to uh, listen to him speak. He was kind of, a, besides the great writer, but he was a futurist back then, 20 years plus, 30 years. Did he have any influence for you, uh, what he did and what he wrote about? Was there any influence for you? Hold on. So, and I'm doing this, I'm, and this is not, this is not a joke. This is absolutely true. Um, I can show you, so, um, now it's probably not going to show up in here. Um, I, every June, I read uh, Ray, Ray Bradbury's Dandelion Wine, every single June, um, if it's, because it's, it's such a powerful book about um, being a, a young boy and being a young boy in June, that for me, every Every June, I read Bradbury's Dandelion Wine, but then also read some of his other works. Um, because one of the things that is incredibly important that um, I tell folks is that imagination is one of the most underutilized skills that we have. Um, because we're living in a time, and as a technological futurist, we're living in a time where Science and technology have progressed to the point where what we build is only constrained by our imagination. Right? I showed you that slide where compute is getting so small that we can turn anything into a computer. Right? We can do anything with our businesses. So the thing that's actually holding us back isn't our science or our engineering or our business. The thing that's holding us back is our imagination. It's our inability to imagine a far better future, and I would say a far more awesome future than we have today. And for me, science fiction does that. I'm a science fiction author. I do a lot of work with young minds and a lot of work with different communities, getting people to write science fiction based on science fact as a way for them to prototype their futures, to think about the future. And I work with a lot of business students. I actually teach in an MBA program where I get my students to actually write science fiction thinking about the future of business. I actually take their business plans. Because, by the way, a business plan really is just a work of science fiction. If anybody has ever done a business plan, it's just science fiction. We all know that. But it's that same thing that you're sort of saying, this is the future that I want, and these are the steps that I think that I can take to get there. So I think Ray, Ray Bradbury certainly, and then also all, all science fiction, is an incredible way for us to have that conversation. And if you find a science fiction story that embraces your future, or what I would urge all of you to do is to write a science fiction story or work with people to write a science fiction story. It's a great, as a, as a team building exercise with your teams in this notion of what are you optimizing for and what's the future you want and what's the future you want to avoid. So actually go through and ask people to write a science fiction story or tell you a science fiction story 10 to 15 years in the future about what that looks like. Because what, what's great about storytelling is storytelling is about people. Right? All good stories are about people. So if you write a story based upon your business thinking about the future, it's still about people. And it's about the cultural impacts and the social impacts. It's understanding people's problems. So for me, it's always been a really, really powerful, powerful tool. Um, and then it becomes this, uh, this currency that science fiction gives us a language to talk about the future and also gives us a way to share what we do. I'll give you an example. So I'm not a synthetic biologist. The young lady who's sitting right in front of me, you're right there. Are you a synthetic biologist? I'm going to guess you're not a synthetic biologist. See, I have to ask because I'll tell you, being a futurist in what I do, a couple of times I've done that. I've said, I'm not a synthetic biologist. Are you a synthetic biologist? And I actually had somebody go, well, yes, I am a synthetic biologist. <laughs> so here's what I do. I do this. Excuse me, by the, gen the gentleman next to you, are you a synthetic biologist? The thing that's really cool is that if you have a science fiction story based on science fact about synthetic biology or about any sort of business, 
it allows us to then have a conversation about it. If you read it and I read it, we have a conversation about it. And again, it's those conversations about that future, about what we're optimizing for, that actually allows us to move that needle. So, yes, I'm a huge fan of Ray Bradbury, and, and thank you for asking. All right. So we have time for one uh, quick question, and then we need to break to get ready for the next session. So who's the lucky winner of the final question? Okay. So over here. Yeah. All right. Um, Max Freund, uh, I don't know if you can see me over here, but with LF Leadership uh, out in Claremont. And um, I was uh, struck by, uh, you know, I was thinking about your, your comment about uh, going, I forget the exact title, but beyond greed or what's next after greed. And, uh, you know, and I was reflecting on a piece that I saw on the Nonprofit Times website, actually, or Nonprofit Quarterly, excuse me, uh, just a couple days ago, referencing a, uh, a magazine in Britain that was created by and for uh, people with uh, mental illness, or as they framed it, mental difficulties. And how this magazine had, been, had tried to make a go of it for several years and basically was closing up shop uh, because it, it simply couldn't keep going. And, uh, you know, and as an, an entrepreneur and as a social entrepreneur, one of the quotes from that story that, that impacted me most was kind of a standard entrepreneurial question about uh, there's a gap in the market, but is there a market in the gap? And so I guess the question that I have is if the, you know, kind of the, the social software that we're living in on a macro level is such that, I mean, you were, you're working in a, uh, a company that's publicly traded and so uh, has a fiduciary uh, responsibility to its shareholders to maximize profit, um, how much, how do we play in that space between changing our micro algorithms to really ask what do we stand for and go beyond simply optimizing for profit or for greed versus uh, changing the macro software of, of the society that we live in and the economy that we, we live in. So for me, you couldn't give me an easy question at the end. Come on, it was the last, it was the last one. Um, so hopefully in a the, in the short amount of time, we'll try to do it to justice. And I will tell you, because again, you are all experts. Right. In the work that you do, you are all experts. And in so much of what I do as a futurist, I am a futurist. It's my job to come up with these models for the future and then work with people to actually say, what do you want? What do you want to avoid? And what are the steps that you need to take? And to get very specific about it. And I, I always try to remain humble to that fact that literally you are a room full of experts, that every single one of you will shape the future of your organization. And so you, all of you have an answer that's probably better than mine. But what I can tell you as a futurist who also does work um, through this philanthropic work and actually does work with, um, um, with nonprofits, for me, that's one of the hardest points, right, is that you have found a problem, you found a gap, you found your passion around it, and you found the thing that you then want to change. And for me, and all the work that I've done with the nonprofits is, number one, I've always trained to change the conversation and tried to broaden the market, to use your word, right? To go out to people, because a lot of people, when you talk to them about the future, they have a really, they're usually very scared, number one. Most of the questions that I get, and by the way, kudos to all of you, I had no fear-based questions. I, almost every time I do this, somebody asks me, like, when are the robots gonna rise up and take over? Or, you know, when will, I mean, people ask me this all the time, and they're very serious about it. And none of you ask that, that's very nice. Means you're a good group. Um, but people have a really dim, dim view of the future. And I've used that, um, that tool or that power of going to people and, and changing that broader vision of the future so that they're more sensitized to that market, as you were saying. So we're saying, this is the future that I believe in, and I have great, so I have great passion around diversity and technology. Not because I think it's the right thing to do, because it is the right thing to do, but my passion is around it is because we need to do it. As an, as an engineer, it's a fact. We actually need to have more young ladies and more diversity in the engineering work that we do. And that's my passion. I know it's the right thing to do, but my passion is that I actually know we need it. Now, a lot of people have, there's a lot of causes. There's a lot of things out there. There's a lot of reasons for people to do that. But what I tend to do is to go out and sort of say, here is my vision of the future. Here's where I want things to go. If we don't do this, here's where I see things are going to go. Where do you think it is? And to start changing that story, start telling people that story, 
And as they then start to tell it to themselves and more people tell it to themselves, it actually starts to make your share of market bigger. Um, and again, the hard work of this is also being flexible, is also adjusting your vision of the future to see if it can incorporate other things. Because you're right, sometimes the markets could be just way too small and that you then need to change your vision for the future as well. Change that is based upon some of the market realities of what you can actually accomplish. And so for me, it's always this kind of push-pull between those two of having these sort of grand, audacious visions, but having my feet firmly planted, planted as a pragmatist, which I am a pragmatist and an engineer, to say these are the realities of the world that we live in, but to always set the bar really, really high. And it's that tension. For me, if you're working in that tension, if you're having successes and having failures in that tension, then you're doing the good work, and that's what you should be doing. All right. Thank you, Brian. And...